Hey, White Sox fans, you do not know the incentives I've had to throw at Darren Black to get him to sit through doing three organizational podcasts and none of them having anything to do with Kannapolis, his very favorite team ever. He's wearing the hat. He's a classic mm-hmm. old school Kannapolis intimidators fan. Let's just say it. Let's say it. Well, at any rate, welcome to Southside Sox on the farm. It's podcast number 22. And it is time to talk about the weirdest team, probably not in White Sox organizational history, but certainly the weirdest one this year and probably the weirdest one in most of our memories because this team was supposed to be gangbusters. And instead, Darren, let me refresh you. 12 best of 12 teams in their division league, 336 winning percentage, 35 and a half games out of first place, a minus, Darren, sit down. 275 run differential, which I actually don't think is scientifically possible. I think that's actually must be wrong on the standings because I do not think that's possible. But you know what, Darren? You know why this is fun to talk about these guys? They ended hot. They took (laughs) eight out of their last 10 and they were ready. If this season was going to be played till December, watch out. They might have been 500 by the end of this calendar year. So, Darren Black. Your favorite team, probably in all of baseball, and that might include the White Sox. We are talking about the Canapolis Cannonballers. Hey, Darren, hell of a debut season for the new ballpark and the new, and the new logo and the new nickname. It was not great. <laughs> they definitely did not intimidate anybody. We have spoken, well, you can't do a farm podcast for the White Sox and not talk probably ever other sentence about his Jose Rodriguez. We're not going to talk about him. He started in Canapolis. Eh, forget it. He's a distant memory in Canapolis. And obviously he didn't help him to wins. Sorry, Jose, yeah. <laughs> step it up. You didn't help. Let's talk about uh, what I would uh, imagine to be um, both the fan vote and your vote for MVP in Canapolis. If it can't be Popeye, And that would be uh, Brian Ramos, a guy who in many ways was uh, almost as impressive as Jose without actually having to change his address this year. Yeah, he really was uh, kind of uh, Popeye's equal throughout the throughout the tenure in uh, Kannapolis. They had the same WRC plus, obviously, in much different ways. Um, And Brian Ramos is a year younger. Obviously, uh, Rodriguez uh, is a more probably dynamic player at this point. Um, and he proved that at Winston-Salem, um, but uh, Ramos, uh, it's the same amount of pop. He has a bit more home run power. He, uh, Jose Rodriguez had a lot more doubles um, in Kannapolis than, uh, than homers, uh, unlike uh, Brian Ramos. And Ramos is not the speedster that Rodriguez is. Um, so little, little differences. Um, but uh, Ramos does not rely on contact as much. He actually had a pretty, I guess, not poor BABIP season at uh, 295, um, but he really relied more on the walk rate. The K rate is just above 20%, so it's not like, um, like it's not, it's not fantastic, um, but it's better than average, uh, especially for a 19-year-old uh, in his first uh, full pro ball season. Um, so, I mean, I'm not going to say sky's the limit for him, uh, but next year is going to be big for him. I'm guessing he's going to go to Winston-Salem. Uh, he also like Jose Rodriguez kind of has to figure out where he's going to play position wise. Um, not the best defensively, but though, I think he might be a bit better than Jose Rodriguez at this point. Um, but those guys are just so young. They've, it'll, it'll, it'll be a while to see the type of players that they are, but both great starts. Um, and uh, at least for Canapolis, the infield was a happy story. Um, mm. Now we got to move on to talk about other positions. Not yet. We are going to still <laughs> keep it positive. But yes, clearly the highlights were uh, old man Jose Rodriguez and young pup Brian Ramos. Yeah. But let's talk about a couple of the guys. Uh, of course, uh, guys who uh, uh, made an impact in Canapolis as well. Luis Macy's and Harvin Mendoza. We have addressed on the Winston Salem podcast. So don't do it now. But, you know, after you finish listening to this very informative and extremely hilarious Canapolis podcast, yeah, go listen to Winston Salem. Somehow you skipped it. Why are you skipping it? We're not just shoving these down your throat. You know, come on. Anyway, two guys that uh, jumped out, at least in terms of uh, MVP votes, and I think probably performance, because they held their own well enough. Um, A guy I remember 
from way back in the DSL, I believe, Samuel Polanco, and uh, Misael Gonzalez, uh, who started out, I believe, the year in Arizona and seemed to hold his own OK in Kannapolis as well. Those two guys impress you at all uh, or about what you expected? Um, well, Misael Gonzalez, overall, I did not expect the season he had because he was I mean, he was really, really good at the Arizona Complex League and got promoted after like 20-ish games or something. Um, and he just kept hitting and hitting and hitting. Obviously, eventually, it has to come down. If you just looked at his ACL Babbitt, it was at 450. So you expect that to go down. But he was still like hitting the ball hard, um, which is just what you want to see. And his ISO is still up. Um, uh, Samil Polanco, I, he was basically the same player as he was in rookie ball. Um, he just kind of had a bit more power. Um, the Babbitt was down. So maybe if that kind of stabilizes, he might be a guy in the future. Um, but, uh, Masiel Gonzalez overall probably had the more, um, positive impact for his prospects, uh, going forward season compared to Polanco. Um, You'll, you'll notice that we do not have an elapsed time up in the corner. We have no ticker on these podcasts. We can't see how much time has elapsed where we spent talking about good things about Kannapolis, but I'm going to guess it's not much. You can look down in your timeline as you're watching this or listening and say, oh my God, they exhausted everything in five minutes. Okay. Well, Darren sort of alluded to it and we got to talk about some rough stuff. And I guess that really has to start and maybe even end with the triumvirate of young arms, at least one of which, which I think we would have expected to have a breakout season as, as it turns out, none of them did. I think Matthew Thompson recovered enough to call the season, at least a wash. Drew Dahlquist maybe got close to that and Jared Kelly sort of disappeared uh what happened darren and uh what are we going to do about it uh well like i've said before uh these guys had a walk problem um they all did uh jared kelly probably had the worst there was really no difference between his k rate and walk rate um and uh that's not good uh, <laughs> uh but again i've mentioned him uh, this might have been on a, on a different podcast but again in 2020 he was pitching high school baseball and then he was pitching in Kannapolis. There, there's a there's a there's a huge difference between high school baseball and Kannapolis. Um, and he obviously just wasn't ready. Um, if there probably was a minor league season last year, he probably would have stayed in the AC or I guess it would have been AZL at that point. Um, but there, there wasn't one, so he was kind of just put in a put on the team that he was supposed to be at if there were a season last year, and he just didn't he wasn't successful. He also had an injury riddled season and he was pretty clearly on a severe innings limit or at least pitch count limit. Didn't really go far at all. And he only pitched 23 innings this year. So didn't, there's a lot to be, he left a lot to be wanted last year, but there's still just a lot of unknowns with them. Um, I think a lot of people kind of are writing him off now at this point. I, I definitely would not yet. It's just like, he had a very weird first and second calendar professional year. I, I just have a hard time saying he's a failure already. Right. Um, he still pitches fast. Um, he just has to get the command down. Um, and if he doesn't do that early next season, I think we should start to worry. Uh, but I mean, he didn't do any, anybody any favors than his season this year. Mm -hmm. um, and really none of them did. Uh, Matthew Thompson, who went from not walking anybody, he didn't really pitch much in uh, 2019, but he didn't walk a guy in uh, six batters. And then he went and started walking a ton of them. Um, and with a guy that generally doesn't pitch as fast or strike out as many hitters as, say, Jared Kelly, um, that's not going to be successful. And though he pitched a lot more, went deeper into games, he probably had better starts than either Dahlquist or Kelly. Um, just here and there, but they were too far in a few between, and he just he he couldn't get it he couldn't get it done. He, when it looked like he was on a roll, he would just have as many games or twice that many games where he couldn't get out of the second inning and would allow four runs because he walked eight guys, something like that. Um, and, and I've mentioned this before, like ten seconds ago, but again, not really having a season last year and being so young, I think really screwed up these guys. Um, and hopefully this is just a blip and they're all ready to go next year. Um, but it's still some concerning signs from guys that shouldn't have had concerning signs at this level. 
You, you alluded to it in that answer, but I'm going to ask you to expand on it a bit. We do see guys who don't have trouble. It's very rare. You see Luis Robert, who frankly did have trouble, at least with injury. We see guys, um, maybe in other organizations, who can sort of burn through a system. Um, and we saw it even with some guys, uh, no pitchers, but we saw, um, mm -hmm. but in the past, we have seen guys like Garrett Crochet, who would have only maybe briefly gotten minors, although there wasn't minors, it was just uh, Schaumburg, um, you know, Chris yeah. Sale, we've seen guys advanced uh, quickly and aggressively. So we know it happens. Is there a temptation because we know that happens or we see another organization like Tampa Bay, look, yet another guy, how many farm teams do they actually have? Um, for us to be a little bit too impatient with guys when they do have what you might consider to be normal struggles, forget even the fact that there was the bizarre old nature of a, a 2020, uh, you would temper caution there, um, at least to see how things in 2020 roll out first half, at least before you say, gee, something's wrong here, because it, it isn't the same path for every major league player. And usually the path involves what Thompson, Dahlquist, and Kelly are going through, which are some struggles and some scuffles. Yeah, I, I would definitely, I definitely subscribe to the thought that let's see in the first half of 2022, and if those same struggles are still there, then maybe those are just kind of the players that they are, mm -hmm. uh, and it'll take them longer to get to the majors than we initially thought, um, or they're just not the players that they were drafted at the time that they were drafted. Um, I also think a huge portion plays into this, that the White Sox just have a terrible farm system. And because their top prospects did poorly, uh, it just makes it look even worse than it. I mean, it is pretty bad, but it made it look worse than probably anybody thought at the beginning of the year, um, taking out, you know, like the Kopecks that were still technically a prospect at the time, even though they really weren't. Um, but they just didn't prove that, like Jared Kelly didn't prove he was a second round pick. Matthew Thompson didn't prove that he was a top 10 pitching prospect. Same with Andrew Talquist. Um, and I, again, I wouldn't write any of them off. I would keep this in the back of your mind, but if um, they do well next year, like go off and Matthew Thompson is throwing five innings each at time out, allowing two, two runs or less, then I would say, okay, last year was just kind mm -hmm. of a blip just because they were so young and their whole entire like everybody else's lives is out of whack, but their professional careers are out of whack because they um, uh, were just not prepared for missing a whole season of pitching at the ages of 19, 20, um, which are really important for that time. Um, but like I, they aren't even selected for the Arizona Fall League, so they didn't even deserve really to be selected for that. Um, and the Sox were clearly very careful with their arms in general. Not really any of them pitched often, which is why you saw guys like John Park, Mike Wright, Taylor Varnell pitch a lot. Um, obviously, Varnell ended up retiring, but they pitched a lot of innings. There was a lot of guys that they used to pitch a lot of innings. Um, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say any of them are failures yet, but it's definitely not trending in the way that you would have liked to see. Speaking of things trending in a way you would not like to see, Darren, uh, <laughs> we have touched, I think, on – the highlights and lowlights of Kannapolis, is there someone we've missed or is there a player, even among those we spoke of, who really surprised you the most with their Kannapolis performance, good or bad? Um, honestly, uh, not anybody good any longer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think the probably the guy that – probably people thought would have been the best out of any of the guys uh, out of the young players that were going to be there out of the Brian Ramos, Jose Rodriguez is on the offensive side. Uh, Benjamin Bailey mm. was really uh, yeah, like, bad is an understatement just because of how decent he was at uh, the, the Dominican summer league. Um, obviously people who thought that he did well, maybe should think twice about uh, the competition level of the DSL going forward. If someone does well, um, maybe that's the Luis Roberts effect because he did so well and then just kept doing well. Right. Um, but maybe we can just say Luis Robert is just good at baseball, just <laughs> yeah. normally. He's, he's in a different category. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, he still is really toolsy. He's 6'4", 215, so good build, very tall. Obviously still has a decent amount of power. He just didn't hit the ball enough. Um, he had a... I mean, he had a 22 WRC plus in Kannapolis, uh, which 
you, you don't really see that over that kind of stretch of games. You only played 21 games, but it's really hard to be that bad mm-hmm. over a 21 game stretch because you would think a ball just bounces just, you know, well once, but it just didn't, it just didn't really do, do that much. The K rate went up 13%, which is a horrible thing to see, especially for a young guy. Um, you just kind of hope at this point that it didn't wreck with his confidence and that he just gets, gets it going um, in the off season to get ready for next year. Um, at this point, I'm not really sure where he starts. I would assume he starts with Canapolis again, but he didn't really, I'm sure Sean will touch on this with the Arizona podcast, but he didn't really do that well when he was demoted, unlike mm-hmm. uh, a Luis Maeses and Harvin right. Mendoza who did do well and did prove that they deserve to be at that level again. Benjamin Bailey did not, but he's still really young still has a decent future um he just it's not as bright as one would have thought going into 2020 or or this season darren it i mean it's still ongoing because we have arizona fall league and you seem to be taking the brunt of those games even though it's very different experience than a six or seven or eight game minor league update night but it was a brutally long season I have your record at 76 wins and 123 losses, which puts you 28 and a half games behind first place recap finisher, Brett Ballantini at 68 and 58. Somehow that guy Ballantini found a way to cover games in this system, winning 10 more times than losing. And again, I don't, that must be wrong because I don't think that's mathematically possible. Uh, But point is, uh, you covered more games than anybody for us. Uh, You definitely, if you haven't (laughs) in prior years working in a system that might have a little more promise, but a major league team that absolutely did not, uh, you definitely earned some stripes for the hard work you've done this year, and I appreciate it. Uh, We are probably going to talk again. You are definitely going to cover a little bit more in terms of the end of season review. As you alluded, Sean Williams will probably be doing the podcast with me, or maybe both of you will, for the Arizona Complex League team review that's coming up in a couple of days but then we are probably still going to trickle out something it'll probably just be norge vera norge vera norge vera norge vera norge vera and then sometimes maybe people mm-hmm. can't pronounce his name will say norge vera norge vera norge vera and then we'll go back norge. to norge vera norge vera norge vera and then maybe norge just for laughs uh but that still adds up to maybe 100 or 200 words so we will have a dsl um summary from you and who knows maybe if we miss each other or i've run out of snacks and i need you to come by to bring some more maybe we will chat for 10 minutes for some sort of dsl season review podcast or if not well that one will just fly alone um but for now this probably wraps things up between us podcast wise for the farm season i wouldn't say that would necessarily be the last of the year because something will probably come up where we'll need to talk i don't know what it'll be but there probably will be something rule five draft Rule five draft. Oh my God. That's going to be um, exciting. Yes. And then I can ask you to explain (laughs) rules to me that I don't understand and you can Uh try to educate me. Uh, Yeah, maybe we will do that, but we definitely will be talking and we will be having you on Southside Sox podcasts proper where we have theme music and everything. Uh, But uh, I hope everyone has enjoyed uh, this run of the first four commercial free. (sighs) As if that's a bonus. It's commercial free. (laughs) Woo-hoo. Southside Sox down on the farm podcast. Thank you, Darren, for taking uh, time with me and managing to uh, keep continuity. Both of us did a great job. Every time we fired up these podcasts, we put the same clothes on as we had the prior one mm-hmm. to make it seem like we just did this all in one night, back to back to back. We, yep. I, Darren, I think we fooled them. Uh, but thank you for doing that because that's not easy. You know, things go haywire mm-hmm. in the wash. Didn't mm-hmm. even clean them. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, you know, we did over here, but you know, you could, you know, you know, and whatever fits, whatever minor fits. League stench right on, <laughs> right on the team on me. And who knows, maybe in 2023, Vox will provide oh. housing for all of their minor league writers. Yes. Uh, that'd be, that'd be interesting. It would be interesting. You might just have to live on a porch, but it would be free. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Okay, so that wraps it up. Thanks, everybody, for listening to all of these. I'm sure you did them in order. I'm sure you were very dutiful about them. You've taken notes and probably have comments and questions. Daryl will answer them. He's always very polite and calm and cool-headed when it comes to discussion uh, in the comments. So uh, (laughs) challenge him with something. I'm sure you're not going to 
you know, you're not going to be joked with or laughed at at all. So go ahead, throw that down at us. Or you could maybe even put in the comments, um, Brett, why are you hosting a minor league podcast? You don't know anything. I'll answer that too, um, because I already know it. You're not telling me anything I don't know. Uh, but anyhow, yeah. thanks all year. This is 22 of these minor league podcasts. We just rolled this out for the first time this year. Darren's been with me for pretty much every one of them. Uh, and uh, you guys have been too. It is a very popular podcast and the minor league updates continue to be somehow. Thank you all uh, players and uh, player families and player girlfriends and player boyfriends and player pets because uh, you guys keep driving the minor league updates on a nightly basis to be a very well-read article. We're glad we provide you something that maybe you can't get anywhere else. And Darren Black is the one most often doing that. So thanks Black 47, Darren. I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously, I'll still be doing Arizona Fall League, but I'll be here next year. <laughs> you can't get away now. You're shackled, man. No, <laughs> you I don't. I mean, <laughs> the Rule Five draft is so close. <laughs> I mean, nobody can see it. I mean, most people are just listening, so they don't know. I mean, I am right outside your door. You think you're gonna like go out and you know like get a late dinner or something? No, you're going back and you're gonna finish that Arizona Fall League thing tonight, and yeah. then okay, <laughs> then maybe it's snack time. Fine. Uh, but at any rate, uh, from uh, on behalf of my roommate that he doesn't realize is his roommate, Darren Black, I am Brett Ballantini hosting the Southside Sox on the Front Podcast. This pretty much concludes, at least for me and Darren's purposes, our business for the 2021 season and on to the Rule 5 draft and the fun of a 2022 that can't possibly be worse than 2021. So let's look forward to it, Darren. Well, I mean, it could be like 2020 and there is no season, so... Maybe See, look at this man. This guy is seeing sun everywhere, even in Chicago in mid October. It's delightful. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for listening and reading and keeping this thing going. We wouldn't be here without you. And uh, thanks, for, Darren, for everything you do for us. And let's do this again at Rule Five, or I don't know, next time yeah, we get hungry and need to go get a bite to eat. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>